shriek. Ballistic motion. First problem. The Fellowship is sleeping in a side room they found in Moria. There's a deep well in here. Pippin, ever curious, is wondering just how deep the well is. He drops a pebble, pebble into the well. Five seconds later, he hears a splash. He doesn't really know how to deal with air resistance, so he's going to assume that it's never significant. Huh. He's a total physicist here. So, part A. If Pippin assumes the speed of sound is fast enough that the amount of time it takes for the sound of the splash to reach him from the bottom of the well, how deep does he estimate the well to be? And the first thing you're thinking is, oh my god, speed of sound, where does that even come in? Well, all right, let's slow down a little bit. It turns out I kind of already did this in class. But here's the picture of the well. Um, it's water down here. That's where you hear a splash. And there is some depth of the well that we don't know, so we will call it D. And then here is Pippin, ever curious hobbit, on his hands and knees, looking down. And he's got curly hair, because that's what he looks like. Although... He's dropping a pebble because this is book Pippin, not movie Pippin. Movie Pippin kicks a whole gigantic skeleton with a suit of armor in. The book, much more subtle. So he drops a pebble um, from here, and it's going to fall down. Splash. Well, okay, that's going to take a certain amount of time. If the speed of sound is not infinite, it actually then takes time for the sound to reach him again. We're going to start by ignoring that. So if we're going to assume that he hears the splash at the same time as the sound of the splash is made. That's part A. So we assume that. So all we have to do is figure out what is the time it takes for the ball to fall like this. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do this thing where I define plus x to be in that direction. What? x is to the right, you're thinking. No, it doesn't matter. x is whichever direction you want. So I'm going to define plus x as that way, because that's the direction things are moving. We know that the equation we have is r is equal to r sub 0 plus v sub 0 t plus one-half a t squared. Well, is that the equation we have? When does this work? This works when the acceleration is constant. Is the acceleration constant? Yes. The acceleration is constant. In this case, the acceleration is going to be plus g comma zero comma zero. Because gravity acts downwards, plus x is the downwards direction, so there's no component either. I haven't even told you which way is y and z. It kind of doesn't matter. You can make y that way and z that way, and it would be fine. There's no gravity in those directions. So that's what gravity is, and this is, in fact, constant. So we can use that one. We also have v0 equal to 0, and I'm going to define x equals 0 right where he drops it from. So r0 is equal to 0, and the d we're after is just whatever the final distance it goes in. So what I'm going to do is just pull out the x component of this equation, and that tells us that x is equal to r0, which is 0, plus v0 times t, plus 1 half ax, and ax is g, t squared. Seconds. How deep is the well? We don't even have to do any algebra. We're basically done here. So x, and we know x, the maximum distance it goes, that's what we've already called d here. So that's going to be 1 half assuming Middle Earth has the same acceleration from gravity as we do, also assuming its physics are the same, which is maybe not a good assumption, magic. Well, uh, let's not worry about it. And we know it's five seconds, and let's go ahead and pretend that that five seconds is good to two significant figures. So great, now all I have to do is multiply these numbers out, and I will know how deep the well is. And so I do one-half times 9.8 times, remember to square the 5, we all know that 5 squared is 25, times, we get, wow, that's a deep well, 122.5 meters, we only have two sig figs, so we're going to call it 120 meters is the depth of the well. That was pretty exciting. Now we do part B. Suppose Pippin knows that the speed of sound is 330 meters per second. Good for you, Pippin. If he takes this into account, how deep does he estimate the well to be? This is a more complicated problem because it's not just a single motion that we can do a single equation for. So the first thing, and this is always the first thing you should do, is draw out the parts of what's going on, figure out what's going on. If you start with, what equation do I use? You've jumped ahead. Before you get to what equation do I use, you want to draw out what's going on. So here's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to say there's t at t equals 0, he drops it. I'm going to define a new time, we'll call it t equals t1, when it hits. Then another, there's another part to the problem, is that the sound waves 
have to reach Pippin again. So this is a sound wave moving. The sound wave will start moving at t equals t1, and it'll reach Pippin at t equals t2. I guess I should draw Pippin again, huh? He's all exclamation point now, like, oh, I just woke up a whole bunch of orcs, and that's not going to go well for us, is it? And Gandalf will be all, you fool of a took, and Frodo will be all, dude, i got a missile shirt, check me out. And uh, Gimli will be all, I'm too short, and Legolas will be all, I'm an elf. So, fine, none of that's relevant. Um, so, here's what I'm going to do, though. So the sound wave, how does the sound wave move? Eh. Okay, it's possible that the sound wave itself will be pulled down by gravity, but it turns out it doesn't quite work that way. Um, we're going to make the approximation, which is a pretty good approximation, that the sound wave moves through the air just at the constant speed of sound in all directions. Now, what really affects it is not gravity. A sound wave is not an object. It's a disturbance in the air. Things like pressure variations and temperature variations in the air will affect the speed of sound, but that's secondary. So it's just going to move at a constant speed. So the sound wave's equation of motion is just going to be, well, the sound wave has constant velocity, which means the, we'll say, A sub S wave of the sound wave is zero. It has constant velocity zero, comma, minus V sub S for the speed of sound, comma, zero. Y minus, because I've defined plus x that way, and the sound wave is moving in the minus x direction. So we have two parts to this problem. We have the first part, we're on the way down, and I'm just going to pull out the x component. We have the x of the pebble, so I'll say x sub p, that's not x sub p of Pippin, that's what Gandalf recommends, but that's not what we're doing. Starts at 0, it has v0 of 0, so that'll go away. Um, plus one half g t squared, okay? Well, and then what we're going to put in is x p is equal to d at one half g t one squared. Now things are going to get a little fancy. This shouldn't have been t two. This should have been t equals t one when the solving. So that's great. That's that first thing. That's t one. All right, little video cut there. Um, anyway, I think I've reproduced the board correctly. Oh, 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 hidden stuff. You didn't see that. Okay, good. Uh, I think I've reproduced the board correctly, except it looks like I've used a lighter brown pen. That happens. Ah, darker brown pen. I will continue with the darker brown pen. I hope you feel good about that. Okay, here's the deal. On the way up, sound wave moving at constant speed. So you think we've got, with constant speed, we can use this. R equals R0 plus VT. Yay, constant speed. Good. Here's the problem with this. This R0, when I gave you this equation, is R at t equals 0. And here's the problem. At t equals 0, the sound wave did not even exist. So we don't know this. It's not even defined, really. So what we're going to do is step back and think about what does this really mean? What this really means is you start at some position and you go moving away from that position at constant velocity, what this t really is, is time since r equals r0. That's what this equation really means when you think about that. Well, okay, so if I put in the r at t1, I could write this equation as r equals r0 plus v times t minus t1. Now, instead of having this be the r, in fact, instead of r0, let's go ahead and call it r sub t1. Right? Instead of having this at time t0, we, we start it at time t1, and we multiply the velocity by the time since t1, which is just t minus t1. So let's use this instead. We're going to pull out the x component, which I will do up here. So the x component of this is that x of the sound wave is equal to x0, or x of the sound wave at time t1, that is d, because we've defined x equals 0 here, positive x, so I left that off when I redrew this, so plus x is that way, here is where x equals 0 is, and so x is equal to d, um, the x component of v is minus vs, times t minus t1, and now we have that. So now we can proceed. So how do we proceed? Well, okay, 
we have to step back and think, great, I kind of worked out the equations that describe the system. I did that by thinking about the system, by drawing pictures, by asking myself which things are constant, what can I deal with? Let's think about what we know. What is given here? Well, the first thing we don't know is D. D is what we're after, so we don't know that clearly. That's what we want. Excellent. What do we know? We know the speed of sound. We are given that. Um, we are given um, T. So the, the speed of sound is 330 meters per second. T is the total amount of time. Really, if I put in T for T2, if I say at T equals T2, that is five seconds because at t equals zero, it's, this goes down, and five seconds later is when he hears the splash. So we know t. That's excellent. Um, we know g. g is 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, the other thing we know is x of the sound wave, because if we put in t of t2, where is the sound wave at time t2? The sound wave is at x equals zero, so we know the x of the sound wave. So what we're left with is the stuff we don't know. And what we don't know is T1. We also, so we don't know this T1. We also don't know D. D is what we care about. T1 we don't care about. But I've got two different equations and two unknowns. So if the equations are independent, don't worry about that. But sometimes you can have two equations and two unknowns. Like as an example, if I say y is equal to x and 2y is equal to 2x. I have two equations, two unknowns, but it's not enough information to find them separately. These equations are not independent because I can get this one from this one by just multiplying the whole thing by 2. Kind of a trivial example. Turns out these equations are independent. Two equations, two unknowns, so now I just have to solve the algebra, which at some level, you say, okay, the physics is done, but we, yeah, we want to be able to do the algebra too. So let's do the algebra. We don't care about T1. Maybe we do later, but what we really care about is D. So my first goal should be to get rid of T1. So let's get rid of T1. I'm going to do that with this because it looks pretty easy here. Um, I multiply both sides by 2. So I have 2 times D. I divide both sides by G, and so I'll have 2 times D over G is T1. And then I will take a square root of both sides, and I've now solved this equation for T1. I did a couple steps of algebra at once there. I multiplied both sides by 2, divided both sides by G, took the square root, so t1 squared became t1, and the right side became that. And that's good. Now I can substitute that in over here. I have 0 is equal to d minus vs times t, which is known minus, and now I have to put this thing in. I don't need the parentheses, really. Minus the square root of 2d over g. And now this starts to look a little bit scary, because I have d, and I have d under a square root. And I don't know how to deal with that. However, there is a thing I do know how to deal with, and that is if I had had zero, I don't know if you're going to be able to see that pen, I'll use a different one. If I had had zero is equal to something or some mess of things times t squared plus some other thing times t plus some other thing, I do know how to deal with this because I can use the quadratic formula, which I don't expect you to have memorized. I'll give it to you. Um, but it's something you almost certainly did in high school with algebra. The quadratic formula is going to be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. I've been using this for so long, I've got it memorized sort of by accident, all over 2a. And though, so that'll give me two different answers for t, and then I'll know what t is. That's very exciting. So now that, so if I can get this into this form, well, can I? Well, think, if I square this, oh, it's going to be ugly. But if I can get the square root all by, its side, all by itself on one side, all the square roots will go away. I'll just have a d. But I will have things with d squared, so I might be able to get it into this form. So stick this aside somewhere. I'm going to erase it because I'm going to need the board space. But stick this aside, and I'm going to pull it out. And we're going to remember it in a moment. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase a lot of the board and put the things we're working with at the top so that we can actually get the answers out. So OK. so. Here's what we've got. This is what we've got. Now we've got to do the algebra. And again, remember, the goal is to get it into a form that looks like this. We replace this with x, but really it's d is the thing we're solving. So instead of x, we'll have a d. And remember what I said is I want to get the square root all by itself on one side. So let's start by getting the d. Actually, I'm going to add the v. And I'm going to do the d over to one side. So I'll have a minus d is equal to minus vst. 
I'm also going to factor the minus VST in. So plus, because minus and minus goes to plus, VS root 2D over G. Okay, so far not so bad. Add VST to both sides. So I have VST minus D is equal to VS root 2D over G. Okay, still not so bad. Divide both sides by VS. So we have T minus D over VS. Divide the left side by VS. Remember, you divide the whole term by it. Equals root 2D over G. And good, I'm now done. I can now square both sides, and that'll get rid of the square root. The left side, all right, I did one of these before. So I'll just write it out again. T minus D over VS times T minus D over VS. You multiply the first term, factor the first term into this whole thing, so I get a T squared minus dt over vs. Good. Now I factor the second term, which is minus d over vs, into this whole side. So I start with minus dt over vs, and then I'll have plus d squared over vs squared. That's the left side is equal to the right side squared is 2d. Camera battery ran out. I guess I probably should have been paying attention to some low battery warning or another. Lost my brown pen, continuing in purple. So all right, we have the left side squared out. Right side squared is easy. Still not yet in this form. So to get it in this form, well, I want a times x squared, and life will be easier if a is 1. So I'm going to multiply this whole thing by vs squared. Actually, the first thing I'm going to notice is these things can go together. I'm also going to add this over to this side because we want the whole thing equal to 0. So I have a t squared minus 2 of these, right? t over vs. And then I'm going to add this over here, so it's a minus d over g plus d squared over vs squared. And d is the thing we're solving for. Yes. So what I'm going to do is multiply the whole thing by vs squared. I'm also going to rearrange it. So the x squared, well, d is the variable we're after, is the first term. So multiply this by vs squared, I just get d squared. Next, the thing's multiplying d. Well, I'm going to factor the d out, because that's how we want it to look. And we have a minus 2t over vs, but then we're multiplying it by vs squared, so it becomes minus 2 vst. So the vs squared, one of them cancels the one in the denominator. And I factored the d out, so I have a minus 2 over g, and then we multiplied the whole thing by vs squared, so I have minus 2 vs squared over g. All right, so I've done these three terms, then we have the last term t squared, but remember we're multiplying everything by vs squared, so I have vs squared t squared is equal to 0. Good. Now that's in the form we want, except a is 1. Well, let's do a and c first. c is vs squared t squared. And here's the scary one. The scary one is b, which is equal to minus 2 vst minus 2 vs squared over g. And you're thinking, oh my god, this is long algebra. But you know, it's just algebra. Just be careful as you're doing it, and it'll work. And so now we use the quadratic formula. Let's go ahead and plug in. We know that d is going to be equal to minus b, so that's 2vst plus 2vs squared over g, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. I have to multiply a binomial again, so I'm just going to do it out. I encourage you to write this out and make sure that I did it right. So I get 4s squared t squared, 4vs squared t squared, plus 4vs to the fourth over g squared, plus 8vs cubed t over g. That's that, minus 4ac, so minus 4a is 1 times c, vs squared, and this is all still within the square root, t squared. And now notice what's cool is that this cancels that. Hey, that's pretty good. And the whole thing is all over 2a, all divided by 2. Well, now I'm going to go ahead and factor this 2 in here, because I have a 2 here, so I can cancel it, cancel this 2. When I factor the 2 into the square root, remember, I take a, it'll take a 1 half out front, it becomes a 1 quarter. So that's going to cancel this, that'll cancel this and make it 2. Right? When I put the 1 half in the square root, I have to square it because I'm moving it into a square root. So it becomes that. So d is equal to vst plus vs squared over g plus or minus the square root of vs to the fourth over g plus 2vs cubed t over g. Interesting. Great. I am at the point where I could plug in, so I will. Let's just do it. We don't know whether to use the plus or minus, so I am going to use them both, see which one makes more sense. 
So let's start with D is equal to Vs is the speed of sound, 330 meters per second times T, which is 5 seconds, plus Vs squared, 330 meters per second squared. My, that's going to be a big number, divided by G, 9.8 meters per second squared. Make sure the units are working. Seconds cancel seconds. We have meters. Meters squared over meters. We're left with meters. 1 over second squared cancels 1 over second squared. Happiness. Start with the plus. Plus the square root of Vs to the fourth over G. So 330 meters per second to the fourth divided by 9.8. And already I can see we're going to be in trouble. Meters per second squared. And that's because this was a B squared. And I did B squared wrong. No, I didn't. I just copied it wrong. See, this was a G squared here. So it should be G squared there. I'm happier because the seconds to the fourth will cancel seconds to the fourth, meters to the fourth, meters squared. I'll be left with meters squared under the square root. That becomes meters. Happiness. Next, plus 2 times Vs cubed. Wow. 330 meters per second cubed times T, 5 seconds, all divided by G, 9.8 meters per second squared. The units work again. I have meters cubed over meters, that becomes meters squared, it's under the square root, yay. 1 over seconds cubed divided by 1 over seconds squared is 1 over seconds times seconds. The units all work. So now I just have to put this monstrosity into my calculator, and I will do that. Okay, and so when I do that out, I saved you watching me type on my calculator. I get, uh, how many sig figs do we have? 2, 2 in the 9.8, 2 in the 330, let's say 5 is good to 2 sig figs. I get D is equal to, are you ready for this? 25,000 meters. So adding in the speed of sound delay um, makes it so much deeper. That can't be right. Let's try the minus. I know you may have been in the same. So always use the plus. It's easier. No. Let's try the minus. Well, when I do that and I calculate it out, I get 107 meters. I'll give you three sig figs because it's just right over 100. Whatever. Call it 110 if you want. That makes more sense. You would expect the well to get a little bit shallower um, when you take into account the fact that it takes the speed of sound some time to come back. So, that was long mostly because of the algebra. The most important thing is, is setting it up and being able to work through and think through the pieces so you can turn it into stuff we can just work with the equations. You should be able to do the algebra too. I know that's kind of long and kind of hard, but it's not hard because, oh my god, he just did two boards of algebra. Each step you should be able to do and you just kind of be very careful working through it and you get to this. I'll tell you myself, when I did this, I made mistakes four or five times. That's part of why there's a lot of cuts in these videos. Um, it's okay, you make mistakes, but you go back and check. One of the real things you do is put these units in and make sure they're all working. That's how I found some of my mistakes when I was doing it. That's the first problem. It was a doozy. Because that first problem was long, as these video problems go, there are only two problems. Here's the other one. Napoleon is trying to conquer the world. To do so, he needs to understand how best to fire his cannons. On a test range, he fires one of his cannons with a burial oriented at an angle 20 degrees above the horizontal. So here's your cannon. What that means is when it fires the cannonball at velocity v0, the angle theta there is 20 degrees. The cannonball hits the ground 100 or 1,500 meters away. So this distance here is 1,500 meters, which I will call x. For purposes of this problem, ignore air resistance. Okay, good. If Napoleon orients his cannon so that his cannon is 25 degrees above the horizontal, how far away does the ball hit? Well, all right. Let's just think about what's going on here. In fact, this is x for whatever theta. And we know if theta is 20, x is uh, 1,500 meters. 15, yes, 1,500 meters. Good. Well, we again, we have, this is a constant acceleration. Acceleration in this case, let's define our axes. I'm going to make the origin here. We'll define x and y that way. Probably I should draw them on the axes, but there's stuff drawn there already. So the acceleration that we have is 0 minus g0. Zero. It's only in the y direction. We also have that r0 is equal to 0 because it's the cannonball starts at the origin. 
So the equation that we have for constant acceleration, is this constant? Yes, g is a constant. It never changes direction. It's always the same magnitude. As r is equal to r0 plus v0 t plus 1 half a t squared. r0 is 0 in this case. That makes it a little easier. Let's think about v0. Well, as before, if that's v0, right, that's the magnitude of v0. He's v0y. This is theta. Opposite over hypotenuse is sine. So v0y is v0 sine theta. And v0x is v0 cosine theta. Hooray. Um, good. So now I know what v0 is. I know what a is. Hey, I can figure stuff out. So let's break this into the two components. z doesn't matter. Nothing's moving in z. We have x is equal to v0x, which is v0 cosine theta times t. And that's all there is to x, because ax is 0. And we have y is equal to v0y, which is v0 sine theta times t, minus 1 half gt squared, because ay is minus g. Well, all right, that's great, but what can I do with this? What am I really interested in? Well, I am asking, if the angle is theta, if the angle is 25 degrees, how far does it go? So I think, well, great. Uh, it means I have to figure out a t. I can get t from this, but I have to know the v0. How am I going to get the v0? Well, here's the assumption we're going to make. We're going to make the assumption that the muzzle velocity of the cannon is the same regardless of the angle of the cannon. That's probably a halfway decent approximation. So making that approximation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the one where we know theta. So when theta is 25 degrees, we know x is 1,500 meters. So I can, well, I still don't know t, but I want to find v0. So what I'm going to do is um, put these two together in order to get it all by itself. So I want to get rid of t. I do not care about t. But here's the next thing. Let's think about what is the condition for how far the cannonball goes. Well, that's when it hits the ground again. Mathematically, how do I say the cannonball has hit the ground again? Well, that is y equals 0. That's when it hits the ground again. I want to find the t such that v0 sine theta times t minus 1 half g t squared is equal to 0. Right? What's y? I don't know. Well, that's how you figure it out. I want it to hit the ground. Good. And it started from the ground. It hits the ground. Obviously, if I plug in t equals 0, uh, this works. That's not interesting. That's just when the cannonball was fired. It was it. All right. So who cares? Let's find the other t. So if I add 1 half g t squared to the both sides is equal to v naught sine theta times t. And I want to make sure this t is not inside the theta. I can divide both sides by t so that t squared becomes t. I've run out of board space, so I'll write that. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2, divide both sides by g. I get 2 v0 sine theta over g is equal to t. And that's nice, because I can now plug that in here. I get x is equal to v0 cosine theta times t, which is equal to 2 v0 sine theta divided by g. That's what t is. Or it's 2 v0 squared sine theta cosine theta all divided by g. That's what x is. Except, and let's save this, we're going to use this again. Except, let's start with the one where we know x and we want to find v0. So if we start with that, I just have to rearrange this a little bit, solve it for v0 basically. Multiply both sides by g, I'll get a gx. Divide both sides by 2 times sine theta times cosine theta. That is v0 squared, so take a square root of both sides. And that's my v0. So now I can find my v0. Let's do that. Let's put the numbers in. g is 9.8 meters per second squared. x is 1,500 meters. 2 is 2. Sine of, what did I say? You said 20 degrees times cosine of 20 degrees. All right, let's plug that into my calculator. And when I do that, actually, I really just did that in my head, right? You can do that in your head. No, I, I did it in my calculator. 
I get, oh, I have to go look, because I already forgot, because I was being foolish. 151.2 meters per second. I only have two sig figs, but this is an intermediate number. I'm going to use this uh, for the future, so I want to keep a couple of extra sig figs. So now I know V0 is 151.2 meters meters per second. Knowing that, I can actually complete part A here, which is at 25 degrees, how far does the cannonball go? Is it going to be farther? Is it going to be less far? Mm, let's find out. So at 25 degrees, we plug in 2 times 151.2 meters per second. Extra digits kept because it's an intermediate calculation. Times sine 25 degrees times cosine 25 degrees all divided by G 9.8 meters per second squared. I have second squared, second squared is denominators, will cancel. Meters squared divided by meters will be meters, the right units. It means I'm not necessarily wrong. Okay, and when I do that, I'm just gonna keep two sig figs because this is a final answer I will not use again. I get 1,800 meters. So hey, it went farther when it went up to 25 degrees. Very nice. for theta equals 25 degrees. Next question, if I, uh, at what angle must he orient his cannon if he wants to hit a target 2,100 meters away? Not gonna do it, it is too hard. Ha ha, skipped, that was fun. If he orients his cannon at an angle of 70 degrees, how far should it go? Hmm, let's find out. Do you think, oh, it's even higher. Maybe it'll go even farther. Let's find out. Well, all I'm gonna do is substitute in a 70 degrees here in place of the 25, and let's see what we get. What I get? 1,500 meters. Whoa. That's kind of interesting. It's the same as 20 meters. You might have seen something like that in lab if you're watching this after lab, which almost certainly you are, because I probably won't have it online until shortly before lab. Hmm. Whatever. Anyway, there's a bunch of stuff you can do with this. How you actually figure out what is theta given x is kind of tough because you have this sine theta, cosine theta in here. There's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one way is to go deep into a rabbit hole of trig identities. Another way to do it is actually to do it numerically on the computer. We're not going to get into that in this class. So that's the second problem. That's enough for this week, I think. Um, good. Bye.